Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, so uh, wouldn't we all like to find uh, 500 great engineers to work at our companies? So um, just a little bit about me. Jerry did a nice intro. Uh, just really quickly, um, I uh, was born in Brooklyn, uh, grew up in New Jersey. I uh, went to Rutgers University after graduating school. I worked at Yahoo for a couple of years, and then for the past six and a half years, been here at Pinterest. And so this is the team when I started. Uh, we were only, uh, I was the 14th person at Pinterest, and so a uh, small little team uh, down in Palo Alto. And uh, this is the team today. Um, and so uh, it's much, much bigger. But over the past six and a half years, um, I've had the privilege to help grow the team from um, just the small team that you saw on the previous slide to now we have close to 600 engineers working at Pinterest. Um, so when we talk about finding great talent, there's three parts at a really high level. I think Joe in his earlier talk really broke into a detailed view of the funnel, but I'm going to talk about three high-level buckets, which is finding great talent, evaluating talent, and then closing those individuals. And so how do you find talent? So we're going to start here. Um, so Silicon Valley is a very competitive place right now. Uh, you've got the big companies, you know, the hoolies of the world, uh, competing uh, against the Pied Pipers and the startups out there. And a lot of times just competition feels like an arm wrestling match between these companies to, to find this talent and, and then bring them into their companies, right? And so a lot of this, I think, is because in many ways we're looking for the same types of people. And so... Um, Take John, for example. Uh, this is, you know, an example candidate. Uh, grew up in the Bay Area, Stanford graduate. I've been programming since 12 years old. Uh, and this is like the ideal candidate that we all would love to have at our companies. But for every John out there, there's thousands of other candidates. Um, and I think we just need to think a little bit differently about uh, who we're looking for in terms of talent. So when I talk about my story, and I briefly touched on earlier, uh, I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn uh, before it was cool and hipster as it is today, uh, raised in New Jersey, went to Rutgers University, and at the time uh, when I was graduating, it was actually very difficult to find a job in tech, believe it or not. The New York tech scene back then was not what it is today. Um, Google had a, a smaller presence out there. I think there was Foursquare. But there was really a lack of diversity in terms of companies that you can actually work for. Um, but I knew I wanted to work in tech. Um, and it was actually interesting how I, how I, how I made that journey out uh, to, to California and to work at Yahoo. Um, but Yahoo didn't come to our school, didn't recruit heavily from Rutgers. But it was really through open source. It was, you know, when I was not in classes, I was actually contributing to a lot of open source projects in my spare time because I had a passion for building software. Uh, and when I came to Yahoo, uh, it was really interesting because I was surrounded by some folks with, uh, that went to the top schools, like the Stanfords, the Berkeleys, the CMUs, but there was other folks like myself that just had really interesting backgrounds that showed their passion through extra you know, activities such as like side projects, hackathons, or contributing to open source. Um, however, even though some of us were different in the schools and backgrounds that we came from, it didn't actually have a difference in how we contributed uh, or how effective we were at our jobs. Um, fast forward to Pinterest. Um, so this is Yash and Marty, two of our earliest engineers at the company. Um, so Yash, who's on your right, um, so Ben, our CEO and co-founder, uh, found Yash initially uh, to join the company as our first engineer. But he met Yash at a tornado meetup. So Brett Taylor was giving a tech talk about tornado and giving out tips. Uh, of how to use it and where it could be effective. Yash was just attending that conference, and Ben kind of stalked him and was like, hey, I don't know you, but do you want to come join and build the next big thing? And uh, a few weeks later, uh, Yash joined as our first engineer. Um, Marty on the left, uh, you know, Marty actually replied to a Craigslist ad, which said, hey, want to build the next big thing? Come join me at uh, Pinterest. And so uh, that, was, that was an ad that, that Ben posted on Craigslist. But, you know, Marty worked here for a long time, and he went on to become the CTO of Reddit. Um, and, you know, I think the lesson here is that um, be creative where you look for candidates and how you engage them. In these cases, myself, Yash, and Marty, we were all found in kind of unconventional places uh, where you may not traditionally look for candidates. And I think lately things are shifting, actually, uh, to be happening more and more in person. And so I think Joe uh, had a really great point earlier of just the, the, the LinkedIn blast or the email that you get. Uh, more and more I found really creative tactics of engaging candidates 
candidates. And so, you know, recently uh, I had a recruiter actually write me a handwritten note in the mail. And uh, believe it or not, I was like, wow, I opened it and somebody took the time to write me this letter. Uh, another one that I've actually seen is like um, kind of scary, but also happening in, in San Francisco is there's actually recruiters that are stocking coffee shops and actually or, or, or engineering managers that are trying to recruit you at coffee shops uh, to join their startups. So, uh, you know, Kind of funny, but also I think it, it's a way better uh, response rate than than doing something just canned on LinkedIn. Um, and then you know the second point to my stories there, where experience is sometimes overrated. Uh, look for the demonstration of passion, and I think in those three stories that I shared about myself, um, you know I was passionate, so I, I worked, uh, you know beyond my classes to actually do open source work. And in Yash's case, he was showing passion through being at a tornado meetup, which wasn't his day job. In Marty's case, he was passionate about finding a job that he was responding to Craigslist ads for jobs, right? Um, so I think all three of those stories show this level of passion that's really important. Okay, um, and then Eddie talked about this earlier, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, you know, we all heard about the problems of uh, diversity in tech, um, but I want to talk about diversity more as a solution to scaling your engineering team. So, um, you know, really simply put, uh, kind of as Eddie said, like, if you have a diverse team, you really have a broader candidate pool, and it makes it much, much easier to find candidates. Um, this is really important that you actually do early on when you're building your team, because um, diversity just it compounds year after year uh, if you're able to actually hire early on. And so um, what do you do if you haven't done well at this uh, from the beginning? And, I, and to be really honest, I think a lot of companies uh, in the Bay Area haven't done really well at this. You just have to make a very purposeful effort to do better. And, and for us at Pinterest in 2014, I think we were one of the first tech companies that really came out uh, publicly to set diversity goals. And every year we report in on those diversity goals. But um, you know what's really nice about this is it really opens the door for women and folks from underrepresented backgrounds. And, and it dramatically broadens our candidate pool. So this is our progress over the past few years in terms of hiring, and I think we've made significant progress in these areas. And what's really nice about this is the more progress we make, it further attracts um, folks from those underrepresented backgrounds because, because they see like people like them of similar backgrounds working at Pinterest. And so I'm really proud of these numbers and, and the progress we're making, um, but just think of the possibility if we actually were more purposeful from the very beginning of doing this. Okay, and then lastly, you know, diversity doesn't just mean opening that door for potential candidates. It means actually valuing other types of talent. And so going back to my first story about hiring, you know, Johns from Stanford, uh, a couple of years ago, we launched uh, our first apprenticeship program, which was focusing on uh, recruiting and hiring folks from non-traditional technical backgrounds. And so here we provide the training and investment uh, to help them learn and grow uh, at Pinterest. And so I just want to share, you know, this is very, uh, very recent, but this is, uh, we recently launched our 2018 program for apprentices to apply. And I think the stats are pretty amazing. So we had applications open for just two weeks. Uh, there's 10 jobs. We had 802 applicants for these 10 jobs. So, you know, if you look at that conversion ratio, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and while it takes a lot of resources uh, to actually start one of these programs, uh, it's really worth it for, for us because what it does is it brings new skills to our team, first of all, and then it allows us to really select the very best candidates who are thrilled with that opportunity to work here. Uh, and then we, we've had tremendous success in converting these apprentices into full-time employees, and they're more likely to retain over time because they've learned and grown with Pinterest. Okay, so to summarize you know, the lessons in that category, um, be creative where you look for candidates. Uh, and uh, be creative about how you engage those candidates. Look for candidates that demonstrate passion and uh, broaden your candidate pool by setting diversity goals and developing talent. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so now you've found great talent. Well, how do you evaluate um, candidates? And I think this is a very important part in building your team. And so I'm not sure if all of you have seen this tweet. Um, this is from Max, the creator of Homebrew, which I'm sure a lot of you use. Um, so, you know, Max is a great, uh, he's great at building software. I had to actually censor this so it was PG-13 for everyone. But, um, but uh, you know, he, he tweeted about this. He interviewed at Google and he got asked this question, right? Um, and here's a similar one that I found at, uh, on, on a few blogs that's really popular. You know, you get asked a question to do something. 
Um, and hey, I'm going to try to write it in one line, and then the interviewer tells you, oh, you can't do that. Uh, don't use that standard library. Try to do it somewhere else, some, some other way. Um, and the reason I show these is, you know, in some cases, like, it is very, there's a very legitimate reason for asking questions like this, um, where jobs are incredibly important to be performant and algorithmically correct, uh, and it's legitimate to interview for these types of things. But if you look around this room, and, you know, you're going to mingle with other folks later, and hopefully you have before, but if you look at the size of the companies you're building, uh, a lot of times it doesn't matter if you write the most performant or, uh, or correct algorithmic code. You want people that can actually get the job done. And so sometimes this is actually leading you to look for the wrong things. And it creates this WTF moment for both the candidate and you when you realize you're not getting the people that you actually want. Um, so some of the things that I did early on uh, when I was helping build out the mobile team here was we would ask questions that were indicative of what the candidate would do. And so at Pinterest, you know, we have this pretty iconic grid layout uh, that displays lots of images. And um, early on, that was a pretty difficult thing to build on mobile. So we would just ask candidates, you know, simply, hey, can you build this? Or how would you optimize this grid layout? And it was very simple, um, but it got to the heart of what they would be working with every single day. Because if they couldn't, you know, work with this grid layout, they probably probably couldn't work here because everything is a grid. Uh, and so, um, so it's at the heart of experience and it's the heart of the day-to-day the -day job. And so the lesson here is ask questions that are related to the job that the candidate would do every day. And I think this is a really important part. Uh, vet these questions, train interviewers, establish rubrics and criteria for these questions. It's really, really important. Um, moving forward from that, the interview itself, um, this is a very common thing. I think, uh, you know, when I look at companies, it's very common to do whiteboard interviews. But um, to be honest, this creates a very stressful environment for the candidate that they may not perform that well in because that's not what they're used to, right? They're used to, you know, this, which is they're coding on their computer or their laptop. They've got headphones on. They're taking their time. Uh, you know, it's, it's a stress-free environment in most cases, and they're just getting their work done, right? Um, so... The interview doesn't really simulate the day-to-day -day, uh, environment of what they would do. Early on, what we tried to do to make this better is we actually started giving people take-home uh, take interviews, basically. So we'd give them assignment, hey, can you code this up? You have 24 hours, take your time, turn it back in. They get to do it in the comfort of their own home. And when they take it, it shows us not only what they can do if they have the time and space to do it, but it also shows us their passion for that, because we would see candidates go way above and beyond and code up things that we would never even ask for as part or think of as part of the solution. Um, and then, you know, more recently, we switched to more collaborative uh, pair programming interviews in some teams. And so uh, you come in, you're given a laptop, something that you're familiar with, uh, where you can actually write code. And, and, um, and these are, we're given a problem, and you walk through it with a fellow engineer, and you work on that problem together, go through the thought process, actually code it, debug it. Uh, and so it's very indicative of the environment that you'd be working in every day. And so this is the lesson here, you know, create environment that simulates the real day day-to-day -day job. Okay, so next on evaluation is culture. And this is Ben. This is our CEO and, and co-founder of the company. And um, early on, Ben actually interviewed, I think, up to 100. I think we were about 100 people at the time when he stopped doing this. But he would interview every single candidate. Uh, he would take, make time out of his day to do this, to do a cultural interview. Um, and it was really important. And we, quite frankly, did not hire people that did not use the product or, you know, uh, s that didn't embody the right mindset that we wanted to hire for. Um, and this is really important, especially as you're scaling, because the people you hire today really inform and shape the culture and values of the company tomorrow. And so it's super critical that you're screening for culture as part of this process. And for us, particularly early on, it was really important that we – hired people with a growth mindset. And I think depending on what job you do, uh, you could have success in a different uh, field or at a different stage of company. But, but for us, it was super important early on to hire people with a growth mindset because when your company is scaling, you have to wear different hats. You can't just do one job, uh, you know, for the next five years. And so, um, so for us, this was really important. And I think we've actually we made mistakes early on where we did hire people that were different, that came from uh, different companies that didn't really embody this mindset, and it just quite frankly did not work out. Um, so. Screen for cultural fit and a growth mindset is an important lesson.
And then, you know, I want to share one thing that, that happened to us that I think is, is, a, is a lesson we learned from scaling. Uh, this is a picture of Pinterest in 2015. So we're, I think we're actually in this building when we took this picture right here. Um, uh, but the engineering team is much smaller than it is today. Um, but, you know, as we scaled very quickly uh, as a company, we hired a lot of great people um, from gr a lot of great companies in the Bay Area, from Google, from Facebook. And um, what ended up happening is... Uh, we started to see that the questions that we would t ask candidates and the things we would look for and the processes that we developed um, were not indicative of Pinterest anymore. They were almost emulating the, th the problems that these uh, new employees saw at Google or at Facebook. And, you know, that was problems at a different size and scale of a company and really weren't relevant to Pinterest. And so, you know, the lesson here is really like as your team scales, be, it's really easy to develop biases based on the people you hire. So make sure you're au auditing your process early and often. It's a really important part to make sure you're, you're continuing to hire for what you want um, in the long term. Um, so these are the three takeaways from this section. So create uh, an interview environment and ask questions that simulate the day-to-day -day role screen for cultural fit and growth mindset, and as your team scales, revisit and audit your interview process. So I think those are the three keys from there. Uh, and then finally, when you get good candidates, you evaluate them, it gets to the closing stage, right? And, uh, and you know, I think the closing stage is really important, and we're often left feeling like when we have a great candidate, you know, we have to do whatever it takes to close them, right? And, and I hear this all the time. It's like, do whatever it takes. Just get them here. It needs to happen. Um, but, you know, this actually isn't true, and I think it can lead to a lot of bad results. And my advice is sometimes it's okay to lose candidates if they're motivated by the wrong things. Um, you know, I feel like the closing process sometimes feels like this, where it's a tug of war between the employer and the candidate uh, over compensation, but it really shouldn't be, right? Um, this is a quote by David Karp. Uh, you know, we're not motivated by money. We're into build uh, We're into this thing we're building, right? And... Um, you know, obviously you want to give people the room to negotiate and have the right uh, salary and things to take care of their family, but you want people that are fundamentally motivated by the mission of the company as the most important thing to them. And, you know, I think different companies have done different things, and I've talked to, talked to a few companies lately that have been trying some very interesting things around fixed salaries per experience. So, you know, any, everyone they hire at a two-year experience gets the same salary. Everyone that they hire at a six-year bar gets the same salary. I'm not advocating for that, but I think it's an interesting thing that companies are trying and having success with. Um, so, you know, it's okay to lose candidates uh, if it's for the right reasons. Um, you know, I could personally share, we've, uh, we've made the mistake of falling in love with candidates, bending over backwards, uh, making special accommodations, going higher on compensation, uh, changing workplace accommodations, uh, and doing things uh, that we just wanted to do to close them, and it ended up backfiring in the end because we found out that they weren't really the right fit for the company. Uh, and so... And then, you know, the, the other part of this that I'll say is that I think the offer stage, you know, a lot of people just view it as like, okay, we've evaluated them, get them the offer, get them in the building. But to me, actually, the offer stage is, is part of the evaluation stage. And, and I think you can tell a lot about a candidate during that offer stage uh, and how they behave. And so we've had candidates in the past that almost do a complete 180 in terms of how they treat their interviewers or the recruiting team based on the offer that they got, you know. And, and we've actually gone and rescinded those offers and took and taken them away because it really shows, you know, that's probably not the person you want in the building if they're going to treat you differently, you know, the day before and then the next day when you get an offer. So, um, so it's really important to continue evaluating candidates during that phase. Um, so candidates should be uh, primarily motivated by the mission and, uh, of the team and company. It's really, really important. Okay. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about kind of that offer experience. Um, and so I think providing relevant be benefits and uh, a unique offer experience really help in differentiating your company or team uh, in closing that candidate. Um, I can't talk enough about this. I feel like um, every every career website I go to or offer I see has a company bragging about their foosball table, uh, about how, and, and it shows employees playing foosball. But really, there's got to be something deeper and more important that you could be saying about your company than that people just sit around playing foosball all day, right? 
Um, and so, I, you know, my suggestion is do something in line with your brand that's targeted to the people that you want to hire. And so I'll give you some examples of what we've, we've done at Pinterest. And so um, this is a good friend of mine, Josh. This is a really pixelated picture. He'd probably be kill me if he saw this. But um, he interviewed with us in early 2012. Uh, we really loved him. And we were a really tiny team at the time. He had a tremendous amount of competitive offers from other companies. Um, and we knew we wanted to hire him probably halfway through the day. And so by the end of the day, before he even got home, uh, we had a, a uh, package delivered to him with a bunch of Pinteresty stuff, a DIY project, a succulent. And as soon as he got home, he pulled into the driveway and his wife said, you're joining Pinterest. Like, I don't care what you're doing. You're going to that company. They are so awesome. Uh, and, and we want him. We, you know, we got him here uh, and he was awesome. Uh, but even though we were a small team, you know, we thought about these details because it really matters in, in showing that candidate who you are as a company. Um, this is something we've been doing more recently. Uh, so uh, for our new grads that have been joining the company, we offer them a Pinspiration trip to travel around the world. Uh, and it's something really attractive to their stage in life. They just finished like four, maybe eight years of, of uh, intensive uh, schooling or university, so they need some time to recharge. So this is Sophia. Um, uh, who joined our international growth team. She traveled to eight destinations in Europe before joining Pinterest. Gives her a real great opportunity to recharge uh, the batteries before really hitting the workforce. And so, you know, I think this is really unique. This is something that uh, is on with our brand and something that we value as a company. And, you know, I think many other companies are throwing cash at this problem, giving massive sign-on bonuses, but we decided to do something that's very unique to Pinterest, and this appeals to folks in this life stage. Um, and then this is something we've been doing a little bit more recently. Uh, we lean into being very generous about our parental benefits around fertility adoption, surrogacy, and things like that. Um, and, you know, the reason why we did that is because uh, it's aligned with the type of employees that we have at the company and the, the types that we want to continue to hire. And it really provides a great reason to join as a differentiated benefit. So what I'll say here is just align your benefits um, with your target candidates and create great offer experiences. It's really important to closing candidates. So just to review these, uh, it's okay to lose candidates. It's not the right reasons. You know, I, I know that's like hard, but I think it's the right thing to do in the long run. Candidates should be primarily motivated by the mission and team, uh, the, the mission of the team and company. And then finally, align benefits with your target candidates and create great offer experiences. Um, so went through a lot of tips. This is actually all of them on, on one slide. Um, but uh, I went through them really quick. But I'll be around later for questions, and I know we're going to do a Q&A. But I just wanted to thank you uh, for your time and coming out once again. So give it back to Jerry.